reading this morning is from the book of Ruth, chapter 3. I invite you to open your Bibles there. Ruth, chapter 3, verses 1 to 18. And the word of God says, One day Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you where you will be well provided for? Is not Boaz, with whose servant girls you have been, a kinsman, kinsman of ours? Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself and put your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lays down, know the place where he's lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over and lied down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man and he turned and discovered a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? He asked. I am your servant Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a kinsman redeemer. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after young men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am near of kin, there is a kinsman redeemer nearer than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to redeem, good, let him redeem. But if he is not willing, I vow that, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lay here until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, Don't let be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, Bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and put it on her. Then he went back to town. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, How did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, He gave me these six measures of barley, saying, Don't go back to your, your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said, Wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the men will not rest until the matter is settled today. Well, good morning, and uh, good to be with you again on this Lord's Day, where we are continuing our sermon series in the book of Ruth. Uh, we're calling this sermon series, Unceasing Kindness. And uh, it's been my prayer that you have seen glimpses of God's unceasing kindness in this book. And I think that you'll see more of that today, this morning, and then next week when we wrap up this sermon series when we come to Ruth chapter 4. Uh, before we take a closer look at Ruth chapter 3, uh, let's just pause for a moment and uh, let's ask God for his help. Father, we do just pause and quiet ourselves to express our great need and our dependence upon you right now as we open your word and we want to hear from you, God. We want to be shaped and molded by your word, we want to become the people that you've called us to be as followers of Jesus. And we trust that your word here in Ruth chapter 3 is part of how you want to shape us. So Lord, give us ears to hear. We pray, Lord, that your spirit would be at work in each one of us to do with us as you please. We ask these things in Jesus' name. 
Well, I want to start off this morning by asking a question. What would it look like if God's people truly believed to the core of their being that God was both totally for them and totally in control of their lives? What would that look like? What would it look like if God's people believed as confidently as they believe in the law of gravity or that the sun rises in the east or that water is wet? How would it look, what would it look like if they believed as confidently as they believe those things that everything that happens in their lives happens according to the plans of a good and sovereign God? What would that look like? How would it impact the way that God's people view disappointments in life or setbacks, trials, tragedies? How would it impact the way that God's people view criticisms, personal attacks, rejection? How would it impact the way that we view our financial struggles, our relational conflicts, health concerns? In short, what would it look like if God's people believed as fundamentally as they believe that two plus two equals four, that everything that comes to pass in our lives falls under the purview of a God who is both totally for us and totally in control of our lives. What would that look like? Well, in Ruth chapter one, we see what happens when God's people fail to believe that God is for them and in control of their lives. In Ruth chapter 1, we looked at this a few weeks back, we met a woman named Naomi, a woman who has gone through incredible tragedy in her life. In a span of about 10 years, chapter 1 tells us, she's lost everything in life that she held dear, everything that made her life meaningful and secure. In a span of about 10 years, she lost her husband, and shortly after that, she lost her only two sons who die without children which leaves her with no hope of having grandchildren. And now with no men in her life, she's lost her provision, she's lost her protection and her security. And as a result, she's become bitter. She's angry at God, she's wrung out by life, and she is devoid of hope. And worst of all, she believes that her tragedy is a sign that God's hand has gone out against her. She believes that it's a sign that God is no longer working in her life for good. In short, she believes in the sovereignty of God. She believes that God is totally in control of her life. She just doesn't believe in the goodness of God. She doesn't believe that God is for her. But in chapter 2, we saw this a couple of weeks ago, in chapter 2 we see things begin to shift for Naomi. Things begin to change for her. In a series of unlikely events, we see Ruth, that's Naomi's widowed daughter-in-law, just happen to find herself gleaning in a field belonging to a man named Boaz. And this Boaz just happens to be a kind and godly man who just happens to be one of Naomi's uh, hus dead husband's relatives, and he also just happens to be a family kinsman redeemer. If you recall from a couple of weeks ago, a kinsman redeemer, according to God's law, was a family member who was charged with the responsibility of caring for the neediest members of the family, and Ruth just happens to meet this guy. And so Naomi in Ruth chapter 2 adds up all of these coincidences, and she realizes that far from being just a result of pure chance, these coincidences are a result of God's good hand in her life. She realizes at the end of chapter 2 that God has not stopped being good to her. God has been working behind the scenes of her life to bring good out of her tragic situation. And at the end of chapter 2, the light goes on and she sees that. And so here in chapter 3, our text for this morning, we find Naomi with her belief in the goodness of God restored and her bitterness toward God diminished. She no longer believes that God is working against her. She now knows God is at work in her life for good. 
And so the question that the author of Ruth wants us to consider in this chapter, in chapter 3, is this. What does it look like when God's people are fully convinced that God is both for them and totally in control of their lives? What does that look like? Well, as we'll see in the very first scene of chapter 3, that's verses 1 through 5, what we'll see is that it looks like being freed to care for the needs of other people. When God's people are convinced that life is under the direction of a good and sovereign God, God's people are transformed from being people who are inwardly obsessed to being people who are outwardly focused. From being people who are self-absorbed to people who are others-oriented. And we see this in Naomi. Look at verse 1. One day... Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, that's Ruth, said to Ruth, My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you where you will be well provided for? Is not Boaz, with whose servant girls you have been working, a kinsman of ours? Tonight he'll be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor But don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. This is an incredible change in Naomi. In a span of just a couple of chapters, which in the story is a span of just a few weeks, We see Naomi go from a woman who's angry, bitter, and inwardly consumed with her own needs to suddenly she's now a woman who's hopeful, energetic, and she's outwardly concerned with the needs of other people, in this case, with the needs of Ruth. And at the top of Naomi's concern for Ruth is is Ruth's need for a husband. Ruth needs a husband. That's what she means in verse 1 when Naomi says, My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you where you'll be well provided for? Literally, that word there for home, the word there is rest. Naomi is saying, Should I not try to find rest for you? You see, Naomi recognizes that unless Ruth finds a husband, she'll never truly find the rest that she needs and that she longs for in life. She'll never truly find the protection, the provision, and the security that a widow like her can only find in the home of a husband. This is what Naomi said on the way back from Moab when they were going to Bethlehem. She stopped with her two widowed daughters-in-law in in chapter 1, verse 9, and she said, go back home. At least there you might find a husband. You might find a home in the home of a husband. This is what she's saying again here. Should I not try to find rest for you? And so Naomi devises a plan. She's got an idea. She's got a scheme that she's working on. In verse 2, she says, hey, Ruth, have you noticed Boaz? It's been a few weeks you've been working in his field. You've taken notice of Boaz? Have you given him any thought? He's a kind man, is he not? He's a godly man. He's been providing for us these past several weeks that you've been working in his field. What about Boaz? He's single, and best of all, he's part of the family clan. He's one of our relatives, and therefore he's more likely to agree to marriage with someone like you than someone outside the clan, a foreign Moabite widow. He's more likely to say, yes, what about Boaz? But first, before that's going to happen... Naomi says, Ruth, we've got some work to do. All right, I've got a plan here. Follow me. Verse 3, look at what she says. She says, wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. She's saying, Ruth, it's time to end your period of mourning. It's time to walk, stop walking around wearing what you're wearing, looking like a widow who's in mourning. I know you love my son, but it's time to put away those mourning clothes, and it's time to make yourself look presentable and available to Boaz. You need to let him know that you're back on the market. And then she says, then go down to the threshing floor. 
but don't let him know that you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. She's saying, Ruth, make sure he's in a good mood before you approach him. Verse 4, when he lies down, note the place where he is lying, and then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. Now that phrase there, that practice of uncovering someone's feet and then lying down, it sounds kind of odd to us, but apparently this was just a customary, nonverbal way of requesting marriage. This is the way that a woman might request marriage to a man. But if this plan is going to work, if Naomi's scheme is going to work, she says it's got to happen at night, and it's got to happen when Boaz is off asleep by himself. Then you can approach him, and then you can do this. In this way, she's saying, Boaz's honor, which might be undermined by a woman coming and requesting marriage, if she were to do this in broad daylight in front of other people, his honor might be preserved if she does it in this way, in secret, at night, where other people are not around, where other people won't see. She at least still gives him the ability to decline, and that way he can preserve his honor. Naomi is a changed person. She is now interested in the needs of Ruth. One of the things that I've discovered over the years as a pastor is how encouragement can come at unexpected times and from unexpected people. I've experienced this on many occasions. There have been several times where I have gone to hospitals or to nursing homes or even to funerals to encourage and to minister people and somewhere along the way, I find that I'm the one being encouraged and ministered to. And maybe many of you have had that experience too, where you've gone to encourage someone who's dealing with some tragic situation, and they end up encouraging you. I remember one occasion, I was visiting someone in the hospital who was there for a pretty serious health complication. They had to be rushed there in the middle of the night. And when I got there in the morning, I expected to find someone who was in distress, someone who was worried and in, and in concern. But what I found when I walked into the room that morning was someone who was surprisingly at ease and calm. When I asked him how he was doing, he told me that he still didn't know what was going on with them, but that he remained confident in God's control over his life. And then, as if we had been talking about something as mundane as the weather, he just changes the subject and he started asking me about me. He wanted to know how I was doing, what was new in my life. So he starts asking me about ministry. How's ministry going? He starts asking me about my family, how my kids are doing, if there's anything new in my life that he should know about and pray about. And I remember in that moment thinking, I want to be like that. I hope that if I am ever in a serious, serious, tragic situation, that I can be like that at ease and concern with the welfare of other people. And if you're like me, you recognize that that's the kind of person you want to be like. The kind of person who even in the midst of difficult situations can remain confident in God and can remain focused on the needs of other people. The kind of people that God has called us to be as followers of Jesus. But if you're like me, you also recognize that that's not how often it is for us. When hard times come, we tend to turn inward on ourselves, and we become self-obsessed with focusing on our needs, our security, our safety, our future. And we do this because we're not so confident that God will. We're not so confident that God is good and that he's working in our lives for good, so we spend our time securing our needs, our safety, our future, become self-absorbed. If that's us today, the question that we need to be asking ourselves, the question that Ruth 3 is asking us is, how do we become the kind of people who are less consumed with our needs and more concerned with the needs of other people? How do we do that? How do we become those kind of people, the kind of people that Jesus wants us to be? which is just another way of asking, how do we become more convinced that God is both for us 
and in control of our lives. If you and I can become more convinced that God is for us, that he's in control of our lives, and we can believe that as fundamentally as we believe that two plus two equals four, we will become the kind of people that God wants us to be. So how do we do that? How do we become the kind of people who are convinced to the core of our being that God is good and that he is sovereign over our lives? Well, like Naomi, we need to have our belief in the goodness and the sovereignty of God restored. We need to become confident again that God is for us and in control of our lives. We need to be reminded of what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8. Listen to what he says. He says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He's talking about God's people. If God is for you, and he is, who or what can possibly be against you? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? How do we become less selfless, less selfish and more selfless? How do we become more convinced of God's sovereign goodness over our lives? We do it by reminding ourselves that if God has already given us his own son, if he's already given us our greatest need, Christ crucified, how will he not also give us everything else we need in life? If God will do that, then you and I can be freed to be the kind of people who are more concerned with the needs of others than our own. By reminding ourselves that if God has given us our greatest need, salvation on the cross of Christ, then he will give us everything else we need in life. And you and I can be freed, like Naomi is freed. She saw in chapter 2 God's hand come through in her life, and now in chapter 3 she's concerned with the needs of other people. So what does it look like when God's people are fully convinced that God is both for them and in control of their lives? It looks like being freed to care for the needs of other people. And in the next scene, verses, five through, verses 6 through 15, what we're going to see is that it also looks like being freed to take risks for God's purposes. When God's people are fully convinced that God is for us and in control of our lives and will give us everything we need in this life, then we are able to take risks for God's purposes. We will take risks for the things that matter to God rather than playing it safe for the things that matter to us. Look at verse six. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly Literally, the word there is stealthily. She approached stealthily. It's the image of someone creeping around at night. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man, and he turned and discovered a woman lying at his feet. This is a risky situation. There's a lot of tension here in this scene. One of the things that might not be so obvious to you and I as modern readers is just how risky this plan is. There is so much potential right now for misunderstanding and misinterpretation on Boaz's part. This is a risky situation. If Ruth is not careful, Boaz could easily misinterpret her actions as those of a woman who's requesting something other than marriage. And so we, as the readers right now, we're asking ourselves, what's going to happen here? What's Boaz thinking? Is Boaz going to correctly interpret Ruth's actions as a request for marriage? Or is he going to misinterpret her actions as a request for something else? Ruth is taking a major risk here. Verse 9. Who are you? He asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a kinsman redeemer. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. 
And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of noble character. By the way, that last phrase there, a woman of noble character, that's the same phrase that's used in Proverbs 31.10, of a wife of noble character. Boaz recognizes this woman as a woman of noble character. She is wife material. And to Ruth's great relief, and to our great relief as the readers, Boaz doesn't misinterpret Ruth's actions. He knows exactly what she's requesting. He knows what she's asking for. In fact, in verse 9, Ruth adds a verbal request to marriage to her nonverbal request for marriage. Her nonverbal request was to uncover his feet and to lie down. Now she adds a verbal request. Look at verse 9. She says, spread the corner of your garment over me since you are a kinsman redeemer. That phrase, to spread the corner of a garment over someone, can also be translated, spread your wings over me. Either way, it's fine. If you have the ESV, that's how the ESV uh, translates it. If you have the NIV, that's how the NIV translates it. Spread the corner of your garment over me. Either one is fine. The point is that it's a Hebrew idiom for marriage. It's a picture of marriage. It's a picture of a husband with his arms wrapped around his wife and his wife securely in his safety, under his wings of protection. Boaz understands exactly that what Ruth is asking for is for his hand in marriage. And thankfully, Boaz, he accepts. Look at verse 10. He calls this this proposal for marriage an act of kindness. He says, the Lord bless you, my daughter. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. He calls her request for marriage a kindness. That's that Hebrew word we've come across a couple of times in Ruth's, in the book of Ruth. That's that Hebrew word hesed or chesed. It, it refers to God's generosity, care, kindness, compassion, mercy. He says, your proposal to me is an act of kindness. It's an example of God's great kindness to his people. And the reason that Boaz recognizes this proposal for marriage as as an act of kindness, as a reflection of God's generosity, is is not simply because Ruth is asking Boaz for marriage and because he's one of the older men, that's surprising. It's not simply because Ruth's going to an older man rather than a younger man, though that's a part of the situation. The reason he calls it a kindness is because Ruth's choosing of Boaz is due to the fact that he's a kinsman redeemer. She says, spread your garment over me, for you are a kinsman redeemer. That's why he calls it a kindness, an act of hesed, an act of hesed. Because if you remember, a kinsman redeemer is one of the people that God has called, has placed a responsibility on to care for the neediest members of the clan, of the family. Had Ruth simply proposed to one of the younger men, which she was free to do, she could have done that, she could have just secured her own needs and left the needs of Naomi alone. Had she gone to one of the younger men, she could have just ignored the needs of Naomi and secured her own needs. But because she went after Boaz, one of the kinsmen redeemers, Not only is she securing her own needs, she's also securing the needs of Naomi, the neediest member of the family, of the clan. By choosing Boaz rather than one of the younger men, God's purposes for meeting the needs of poor clan members like Naomi is being preserved. That's what's happening here. That's why Boaz calls this an act of kindness. You see, what Ruth chapter 3 is teaching us here is that when God's people are convinced that God is for them and that God is in control of their lives, they are free to take extraordinary risks to uphold God's purposes in the world. Rather than choosing to play it safe and to marry one of the younger men, Ruth puts her reputation on the line and she goes after Boaz. 
so that God's purposes for poor widows like Naomi would be upheld. She risks for God's purposes. She didn't have to do that. What about us? What about us this morning? Are we willing to risk what's important to us for what's important to God? That's one of the questions that Ruth chapter 3, through Ruth's actions, is presenting to us. Is there something important in our lives that God may be asking us to risk so that through us, his purposes might be upheld in the world? Perhaps he's asking you today to risk your image or your popularity, or your reputation, so that through you, the message of the gospel might go out to schoolmates, to teammates, or to the people you work with. Perhaps he's asking you to put your finances on the line, your time, your resources, so that through you, the needs of other people might be met. Maybe he's asking you to risk your convenience, to risk your comfort or your routines in life so that through you a person might be invited into a loving home, so that through you someone might be invited out to coffee or invited right here to church. But as we've seen in Ruth chapter 3, the only way that God's people are going to risk the things that are important to them for God's purposes is if they're fully convinced that God is for them and that he's in control of their lives. If they're not convinced of that, They won't put those things on the line. They won't risk those things. They'll hold on to them. But if they are convinced that God is for them and God is in control of their lives, they will willingly risk those things for God's purposes. Well, at this point in the story, in Ruth chapter 3, in Act 3, we as the readers are feeling pretty good about what's going on here in the story. We like where things are heading. Ruth has just taken a major risk by approaching Boaz at night in this way, but Boaz has accepted. He's interpreted her actions correctly, and he's accepted her request. And now it looks like both Ruth's and Naomi's needs are going to be met through this kinsman redeemer, through Boaz. But like any good love story, there's always a complication. There's always something or someone that gets in the way. Look at verse 12. Boaz says, Although it is true that I am near of kin, there is a kinsman redeemer nearer than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to redeem, good. Let him redeem. But if he's not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. Verse 12 is the ancient equivalent of a record scratch. Imagine the loudest, most abrupt record scratch that you can think of. That's verse 12. In Boaz's honesty, he tells Ruth that there's actually another guy in the picture that she needs to consider. There's another kinsman redeemer. And because this kinsman redeemer is closer to Naomi than Boaz is, This other guy gets first dibs at redeeming the family, which in this case would mean marrying Ruth. This is not what we wanted. This isn't what we were expecting. We were kind of getting excited about Boaz and Ruth, and now it looks like that might not happen. Verse 14, so she lay at his feet until morning, and notice nothing inappropriate happened. She laid at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized, and he said, Don't let it be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. Boaz knows that Ruth is a woman of noble character and he wants to protect her reputation. He doesn't want any of the other men that are up there with him on the threshing floor. He doesn't want them to conclude wrongly about why she's there. And so he wants to send her off before anyone can recognize that she's there. He wants to protect her reputation. Verse 15, he also said, bring... Bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and put it on her, and then he went back to town. Well, again, at this point in the story, at the close of verse 15, this is not quite what we were expecting. 
This isn't what we wanted. We were hoping for Ruth and Boaz. We wanted them to come together and to get married. We saw the stars aligning, and this looked good to us. But now it looks like that might not happen. There's some other guy in the picture. All that we know right now in the story is that Boaz promises that, that the situation that Ruth has presented to him, it will get resolved. He's going to see to it, but that might not mean he's the one that resolves it. It could be this other guy that resolves the situation. And so in the next scene, the final scene, verses 16 through 18, what we're going to see is what happens when God's people are faced with uncertainty. Look at verse 16. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, How did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything that Boaz had done for her and added, He gave me these six measures of barley, saying, Don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Literally, the word there is just empty. Don't go back to your mother-in-law empty. It's the same word that, that Naomi said of herself in chapter 1 when she said, The Lord brought me back empty. And now, Boaz is saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty. Verse 18, then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. You see, what Ruth and Naomi are teaching us is that when God's people are convinced that God is for them and that he's in control of their lives, they are free to wait patiently and to hope in God even in the face of uncertainty. Unsure of what's going to happen, Ruth and Naomi are able to stop their striving. They've done what they can, and now they can trust God with the results. They've done enough. They've got, they had a plan, they worked the plan, and now they're trusting God with the results of that plan. That's what happens when God's people are convinced that he's for them, and in control of their lives. One of the major issues being raised in Ruth chapter 3 is the issue of the human need and the human pursuit of rest. It's all over this chapter. It's all over the book. But especially in this chapter, you can see it in the very first and the very last verses of the chapter. In verse 1, Naomi says, My daughter... Should I not try to find a home for you? Again, the word there is rest. Should I not try to find rest for you? And in verse 18, Naomi says that Boaz will not rest until the matter is settled today. This chapter is all about the human need and the human pursuit for rest. For Ruth, the rest that she needed was the kind of rest that in the ancient world could only come from a husband. Rest from things like physical poverty and physical emptiness. And the way that she pursued that rest consisted of two main parts. First, she saw an opportunity provided to her by God, and she acted on, she acted on it. She saw Boaz as this divinely appointed kinsman redeemer, and she took advantage of that opportunity. She took action. And then, secondly, she trusted. Boaz gave her a promise of rest, and she took Boaz at his word. She took action, and then she rested. She trusted. What about you this morning? want us to consider this issue of rest. Are you in need of rest today? I don't know what's going on in your life, but I'm confident that each of us in some area of our life is we are in need of rest. Maybe it's not the rest from things like physical poverty and physical emptiness, but what about Rest from things like spiritual poverty and spiritual emptiness, that thing that plagues the heart of every person. In the New Testament, we see an incredible promise held out to everyone who needs and is on the pursuit for rest 
we hear it in the words of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me, everyone who is weary and burdened, and you'll find rest. I don't know what you're going through today, but are you in need of that rest? Are you in need of rest for your weary soul? Rest for your burdened heart? If that's you today, in Jesus Christ, you have a divinely appointed kinsman redeemer whom Boaz pales in comparison to who promises to give you rest that you can find nowhere else in this world. So what do you do? If that's you this morning and you need that rest, what do you do? How do you go about pursuing that rest? Well, Ruth's story is instructive to us. The first thing that you must do is take action. Jesus says, come. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. The first thing that we must do if we are weary and burdened and are in need of rest is to come to him. We must recognize this divinely appointed opportunity in Jesus, and we must take advantage of it. That's what Ruth did. And the second thing that we must do is trust. Jesus says, come to me, take action, and I will give you rest. Trust me, is what he's saying. Take action and trust him. So if that's you this morning, will you come to him? Will you take advantage of this divinely appointed kinsman redeemer in the person of Jesus? Will you take advantage of it? And then will you trust him to give you the rest that only he can give you? If that's you this morning, I and the other pastors would love nothing more than to talk to you about that. I'll be here toward the front if you would like to talk about that after the service. Well, let's pray to this God of rest. Father, I thank you that in Ruth chapter 3, you hold out to us this promise of rest. We see it in Boaz. Of course, Boaz being just a reflection of our kinsman redeemer in Jesus Christ. Lord, we are all in need of rest. For some of us, Lord, we, we know that rest. We have come to Jesus. But Lord, some of us, even though we've come to him, we are in need of that rest again and again and again. And Father, I pray that you would cause our hearts to run to Jesus for that rest that can be found nowhere else. For others of us in this room who may never yet, who have not yet come to Jesus for that rest, God, I pray that right now, through your spirit, you would be at work in their hearts, drawing them to your son, causing them to take advantage of this divinely appointed opportunity, and then to trust Jesus for that rest. Would you do this, Lord, for their good and for the sake of Jesus? I pray these things in his name. Amen.